Hello, well today we're going to be looking at perennials for the late summer to early autumn season and as with my uh, previous, uh, what should we call them, uh, mini broadcasts, um, audio, uh, vi uh, video blogs, um, this is going to be quite an idiosyncratic uh, selection. Uh, most of what we grow in the garden is essentially spring or early summer flowering and for a lot of people there's a bit of a gap until uh, the, the end of the summer um, and we have traditionally had uh, a limited but quite distinct range of plants, uh, perennials, that, that flower now and recent years have seen a huge revival of interest in these plants. Now a lot of these plants, in fact the vast majority of these later flowering perennials are what we call prairie plants. They're plants that have evolved in North American grasslands. Now whereas uh, many European and Asian species flower earlier, there are very particular reasons as to why North America has this particularly rich late flowering flora. It's to do with the fact that summers have reasonably good rainfall uh, and so plants in open conditions don't have any stresses. Uh, they can just grow and grow and grow. So there's a lot of competition and they tend to leave flowering till later uh, once they've physically established themselves. They can afford to leave flowering till later because uh, there's usually enough rainfall to keep growth going pretty well through the summer. Now this here is a sort of idealised prairie. It's in the Chicago Botanic Gardens. It's been grown from seed. Uh, and it's very much uh, biased towards the species we find uh, colourful and exciting. Now some of these are plants, uh, in fact quite a few of them are plants that have been in cultivation in Europe for a long time, up to 200 years. Uh, so a lot of these have a good long history of being border plants. Uh, there are some, however, such as the tall yellow silphiums at the back or the grey silver bobbles of Eryngium yuccifolium at the front that have much more recent history, that have only, gardeners have only got excited about growing them more, more recently. Uh, the pinky purple uh, is, is a monada species, probably monada fistulosa, and this is one of those perennials that's been around in gardens uh, since really the, the end of the 18th century. Now, that was a rather hyped up artificial prairie. This is the real thing. It's on the outskirts of Chicago, going towards O'Hare Airport. Uh, it's on a sandy moraine, so it's, it's relatively short, with definitely class as a dry prairie. Uh, you can see there's a lot of grass, but also a terrific variety of perennials. And the range of perennial species in prairie is really quite mind-boggling and really pretty well the vast majority of them are potentially really good garden plants. So it's not surprising uh, that recent years have seen people turning increasingly towards North American grasslands for uh, sources of new plants, especially since the American nursery trade and American gardeners have gotten really interested in their native flora over the last 10 years or so. Uh, the thing about prairie is that over a lot of the uh, what's regarded as traditional prairie country, it's actually a patchwork, a kind of savanna where you have areas of woodland, areas of scattered trees and areas of more open grassland. Prairie occurs in situations where uh, the conditions are not best suited to tree growth, a certain amount of summer drought, fires for example, and the western prairie is definitely too dry. The eastern part of that was to do with North American Indian uh, Native Americans uh, managing the land with using fire. Uh, a lot of that's about uh, getting good conditions for game but also good conditions for great herds of bison that would have um, migrated from south to north and back again every year. So this was a, a landscape that was uh, not just a purely natural landscape, but which uh, the, the uh, Native Americans were very actively involved uh, in, in managing. And there's a lot of transitional habitats. Here we can see down towards the right a woodland edge situation and lots of colourful goldenrods and asters, things that are very familiar to us from as, as border plants. They're not growing out in the, the fully open conditions and they're not growing in the woodland, but instead they're growing in this, in this transition zone. And a lot of the best 
um, garden plants are actually plants from these kind of zones. Uh, there are dry prairies and wet prairies. This is one I've just slung in to show you. Again, early September near Chicago, a wet prairie with a number of Aster and Solidago species. So an awful lot of these late prairie perennials are yellow. Uh, the same shade of gold and yellow, and a lot of them are actually quite tall, and quite honestly, for a lot of gardens, inconveniently tall. Uh, Rudbeckia fulgida is quite a shorty, though, uh, sort of knee to waist height, and uh, it's one of those plants that comes from the kind of transition zone we've just been talking about. So uh, in its homeland, it'll take a bit of shade. Uh, in Britain and Northern Europe, much better in full sun. A really cheerful, long flowering, sort of end of August through to early October. This particular variety, Goldsturm, has got a story attached to it, which I won't tell now, um, that uh, first selected in, in, in Germany um, just before the Second World War. Uh, ended up with Karl Förster, the um, great plant breeder who managed to uh, keep it going uh, until it could be commercially developed later on but a slowly spreading a good low-level golden yellow with this nice dark eye. Uh, so many of these daisies do have the same rather kind of hard golden yellow colour. Uh, slightly easier on the eye en masse is Lemon Queen, which is that much paler. This is a tremendously successful plant, uh, very reliable but not particularly strongly spreading, so it'll slowly form a nice sized clump but without going mad. Um, and these nice, uh, almost primrose yellow flowers on a plant about coming up to about two metres high. Um, asters are the biggest group of these late flowering perennials, which, as you may have gathered by now, are all members of the daisy family. The daisy family in North America just went on huge evolutionary binge at some point in geological time, uh, ideally suited to uh, flowering it in late summer, early autumn. Um, in relatively rich soils uh, with uh, good sunlight and, and reasonable rainfall. Uh, this, however, this in fact though is in fact a, it's, it's a European origin um, aster, which tend to be usually a little bit shorter, but in many ways uh, in terms of as, as, as gardeners pretty well identical in their cultural needs to the, uh, the vast majority of the American ones. Uh, golden rods are another classic uh, North American genus, which unfortunately have rather a bad reputation from a couple of very vigorous species that were introduced in the 19th century uh, and which spread very, very aggressively and seed quite aggressively and tend to be found in places like old railway embankments or abandoned pony paddocks. Um, so a plant with a bit of a kind of scuzzy reputation. Which is a shame because the Solidago genus actually covers uh, a lot a uh, huge number of species, nearly all of which are in fact very good garden plants and they've rather been given a bad reputation by the behaviour of a few of those early ones. Uh, Solidago rugosa forms a nice tight clump, doesn't spread, uh, flowers for months um, and is hugely popular with butterflies. Uh, Solidago uh, goldenrod flowers, uh, flower heads come in various shapes. Uh, speciosa here is more of a spike rather than a, than a plume and some quite nice foliage. Um, the Eupatoriums, uh, known to Americans as Joe Pie weeds, are a group of, again, daisy family, late flowering, a lot of them, by no means all, but a lot quite tall. These are well over two metres. They've long been popular as back of border plants. Uh, designers like Pete Adolf have given them a bit more of an edge now. Uh, and there are indeed some shorter varieties. Uh, they're nice colours, but never sort of amazing. Um, but what they are good for is attracting butterflies. Uh, so you'll often have a lot of very colourful butterflies uh, fluttering around these, these flower heads. Uh, most of them are spread pretty slowly. They put most of their effort into growing skywards, uh, and they make good winter silhouette plants as well. And as with a lot of these taller perennials, they're best on slightly moist soils. Um, in front, by the way, uh, on the right, we've got uh, Veronicastum virginicum, which tends to be a little bit earlier flowering. It's more kind of end of June through to 
early August, so I think this is probably quite a late one. Um, Veronicastum virginicum uh, is uh, a great prairie plant, um, really good upright structure, um, really good is as a seed head plant as, as well as for flowering. Uh, a relatively recently popular group, uh, the pycnanthemums, uh, which are members of the mint family, so they're not daisies, they're members of the mint family, um, and indeed this one smells very, very toothpasty indeed. Uh, these were never really introduced uh, during the great wave of perennial plant introductions in the 19th century. Um, they're of more recent use, uh, possibly this is because it's only recently that American garden designers and landscape architects have started using them themselves. They're quite closely related to the more familiar monadas. Uh, so again, similar minty smell, and a lot of the interest comes not from the flowers, but from these silvery bracts that surround the flower heads. Um, they may take a couple of years to get established, but once they are, they will spread really quite strongly. Uh, so you can use these for creating quite big clumps. Um, a lovely, very late genus, often flowering in October, as the ironweeds, um, venonias. Again, one of those North American perennial groups that, unlike asters and solidargos, didn't get introduced to Europe in the 19th century. Um, but uh, very good for these wonderfully vibrant uh, violet-purple flowers. Now, most of the venonias are tall, over two metres. Uh, and so they're not always the easiest to fit into gardens. However, this one, which is very much shorter, Venonia lettermanii, uh, has recently be become available and it's, it's just really nice for something more about kind of knee height. Uh, coming back uh, to Britain, uh, there are not many wildflowers really in the North European flora uh, that flower after July. Uh, so, somewhat ironically, uh, there's not a huge amount around for butterflies. Um, bees and butterflies are often hugely appreciative of our growing North American perennials. This, however, is one of our native wildflowers that does flower late. It flowers in August and September. It's very much a plant of uh, moist soils in the west and the north of, of Britain. Um, and it is a very good butterfly plant. Uh, it's very easy to grow, uh, but you need quite a lot of them together to make much impact. Um, when I've grown it, I've been slightly disappointed by it because um, there's an awful lot of space, really, between the little flower heads. Uh, but I've noticed that Pete Aldolf has started using it in designs, which uh, I think makes us realise we should uh, take it more seriously. So if you can clump quite a few of these together, you can get some good colour impact. And as I said, you know, for bees and butterflies, this is really a fantastic plant. And its English common name is Devil's Bit Scabious. Um, scabious because, well... It looks like a scabious, it's indeed a member of the scabious family. Um, quite why devil's bit though, I, I couldn't honestly tell you. One of the most reliable uh, plants um, uh, for groups of perennials for this season are the taller sedums, uh, which are, as you might imagine from these rather succulent leaves, uh, very much plants from dry meadow habitats. Uh, there are species you can find wild in northern Europe um, and there are others in Asia and we've got really from the 1950s onwards uh, breeding of various garden varieties which are very good for late summer colour. Their seed heads are also really strong and so they'll carry on standing until well in, 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 into winter so a plant that will look really tidy uh, and even attractive after flowering. It's all, they, these are also very good bee and butterfly plants and that's actually something worth flagging up. That these perennials that have these masses of tiny flowers packed into heads like this are ideal for honeybees and butterflies which like to graze going very quickly from one small flower to another. Um, not so suitable for bumblebees who prefer bigger uh, flowers uh, with larger supply of nectar and they'll travel more between flowers. But for honeybees and butterflies, this kind of flower head is, is perfect. 
there are now a lot of different sedum uh, cultivars. Um, this is just almost a kind of random one, gooseberry fool. A lot of them have really rather attractive colours, not conventional bright colours, but subtle shades and quite often uh, changing colour as they age. Uh, also of uh, European and Asian origin, the Persicarias, a very, very useful group of plants for late summer colour. Uh, Persicaria amplexicoli is from the Caucasus Mountains, uh, and it's been around in cultivation quite a long time, um, but recently we've had some more new varieties. A tremendously useful plant. It is a spreader, but it spreads only slowly and, and really quite manageably. And as you can imagine, it's a very good weed suppressor. It does best on fertile soils, preferably a little bit moist in sun or light shade. I always found it started flowering in, in mid-August, but, but very often carry on uh, into, into early October. Uh, so these nice pinky red spikes held well above this um, very dense matter foliage, a terrifically useful plant for the front of the border situation or for filling in gaps. Uh, a nurseryman in, in Belgium, Chris Gieselin, has over the last 20 years or so been breeding some new varieties. Uh, these vary in the colour and shape of the flower head um, and of the, um, the density and size of the foliage. Uh, so we've now got a lot more to, to choose from. Oh, and the geranium in this picture is one of the few really late flowering geraniums, uh, geranium rosan. So this is very much August and September flowering, which is really quite distinctly later to most geraniums. Uh, I'm putting this North American here, Chiloni obliqua, because it's not really a prairie plant, but more of a kind of light woodland edge plant. Very late flowering with this very fine dark uh, foliage. Uh, I always found it was really one of the last plants to flower in the garden, uh, often not get, getting going till October. Um, and there's a rather wonderful pure white form as well. So for a bit of shade, slightly damp situation, really a very good plant for that very end of the season. Uh, the anemones. Now we're moving now into, uh, we're away from prairies with now more woodland edge, light woodland habitats, and these are mostly Asian plants. Uh, Eastern Asia, China, Japan, Korea has a monsoon climate, so summers are pretty wet, so you don't have anything like the dry shade problem that you have under trees very often um, in, in Europe. And so evolution has come up with quite a wide range of species that flower quite late. Uh, so the so-called Japanese anemones, uh, which in fact are from um, the whole region, China, Korea and Japan, are hugely useful. Good, strong, vigorous plants, although they do take quite a long time to settle down. Very often uh, a plant will just sit there for three years and leading um, the gardener to think, oh, this isn't doing very well and wanting to dig it up and move it. And then finding, of course, it's not been wasting its time. It's been growing a jolly big root network. Um, so once established these will spread um, and they are very long-term plants because they'll regenerate from those roots very uh, very easily. Uh, they often start flowering in August and will carry on until um, September, even October. This is one of the species uh, but there's a good many hybrids and cultivars and this pure white one, Honorine Jobert, is a very early selection, still really one, one of the best, one of the most reliable and the most free flowering. So these are plants that do well in full sun, so long as the soil isn't too dry, but are classically grown in just a little bit of shade. And their foliage is sort of big, expansive clumps, it is also quite attractive and a very good weed suppressor. Uh, the Acteas, which used to be called Simisifugias, are another group for the slightly moist soils, woodland edge situations, uh, wonderfully tall spikes with a rather pleasant scent above this divided foliage. These are really rather magnificent plants. Unlike the Japanese anemones, they don't really spread. They just sort of stay in one place. Um, and can require a little bit of patience to get going, uh, but really magnificent plants, especially when you've got a dark backdrop for these uh, heads of, of flowers. 
A certain number have dark foliage, this sort of purpley dark foliage, which looks very attractive really from April, May onwards. A recently popular group, Tricertis, again from the Far East, uh, plants that do well in a bit of shade, but a bit of shade that's got a reasonably moist soil. And these spotted flowers are really quite fascinating. Uh, they seem to be becoming increasingly popular, a lot of new cultivars, new varieties. Uh, so, um, you know, very uh, unusual, unusual flowers, and but uh, just very good for sort of smaller spots. Uh, for this end of season. Um, coming from South Africa, the, the uh, east of South Africa, which gets summer rainfall, the Crocosmias uh, are a hugely useful group, mostly associated with milder uh, west of England, Wales, West Scotland or Irish climates. Uh, quite a lot of varieties, all in these sort of hot shades. Uh, they, um, they, they flower quite quite late. Uh, and uh, do appreciate a fair bit of summer rainfall uh, and really quite invaluable for this uh, colour range. Uh, also from South Africa, a very late flowering, uh, Schizostelis coccinea, now classified as Hesperantha coccinea. Uh, a, a classic Cornish plant, likes mild winters uh, and uh, fairly cool, wet summers. But these can flower very late. They can even flower in a, in a mild winter, almost up to up to Christmas. I'm popping this in uh, not because it's a perennial. Um, it's in fact just really a glorified annual. But Verbena bonariensis has become very popular for flowering at this time of year. I'm somewhat unfortunate that it is often sold as a perennial and often, I think, massively overpriced. Uh, naturally, these are annuals that grow on mud banks on the River Platte um, between Argentina and Uruguay. Um, so they will die when the river floods again in the wet season. Um, with, us, with us in our gardens, they'll usually stagger on into a second year. Uh, and they also seed around. And as you can see from my old garden here, they can seed around quite a lot, which sort of leads people to think, oh, they're perennial, whereas in fact, their lifespan is really certainly not more than two years. But they do seed around well, and they have this transparent quality that these almost leafless stems, you can see right through them to what's behind. And they are a very, very good butterfly plant, um, hugely appreciated by butterflies and honeybees. And they have a very long flowering season, which is one of the reasons why they become so popular. Um, so they'll start flowering in, in June and uh, carry on until uh, October, even November. Uh, late summer, early autumn, can see some of the uh, Asian clematis flowering, the so-called lemon peel clematis, which have these really thick, waxy um, flowers. Uh, these are sepals, actually, rather than, than, than petals. Most of them pretty vigorous climbers, uh, but a nice backdrop for your perennials. And finally, um, I often think this is the first sign of autumn, flowering in August, uh, cyclamen, heterofolium, um, coming in pink and white forms, does very, very well in dry shade in situations where very little else will grow. Um, they flower first, then the leaves come up and the leaves sit there all through the winter, um, benefiting from the fact that usually they're growing in situations where nothing else will grow. So cyclamen, heterofolium, uh, a good uh, end of summer plant. Give them patience, give them time, um, and the seed will spread and you'll soon have uh, a lot more of them. Uh, so that's my roundup of uh, late summer and um, early to mid autumn perennials, uh, which um, we've got a huge variety available now. And so there's no excuse for having a boring garden at this time of year.